Welcome to this video about principal component regression. We'll start by covering some background and then see how principal component regression works. We'll also discuss how to extract components. Principal component regression is a linear regression technique that involves principal component analysis. Principal component regression is especially used to overcome the problem with collinearity in linear regression by combining explanatory variables to a smaller set of uncorrelated variables. To explain how principal component regression works, let's consider the following dataset. What are the three variables systolic blood pressure, cholesterol level, and age have been collected from six individuals? Suppose that we like to predict the systolic blood pressure based on the two explanatory variables, cholesterol level and age. Since we have more than one explanatory variable in our model, we'll use multiple linear regression. However, it is problematic to use multiple linear regression if there is a too strong correlation between explanatory variables. A linear association between explanatory variables is called collinearity. If we compute the Pearson correlation between the cholesterol level and age, we see that there is a very strong positive correlation between the two explanatory variables in this example. This model will therefore suffer from collinearity, which means that the interpretation of the model coefficients will not be reliable due to inflation in the standard errors. For example, if you start at the output from this model, we see that the estimated parameter value associated with the cholesterol level is negative, whereas the estimated parameter value associated with the age is positive. Let's create a bar chart that represents the estimated parameters of the model. The error bars represent 95% confidence intervals. We see that the estimated parameter associated with the cholesterol level is negative, whereas the parameter associated with the age is positive. An increased cholesterol level therefore seems to decrease the systolic blood pressure, whereas an increased age increases the blood pressure. This does not make sense because we know that there is a positive correlation between cholesterol level and age. We see that the 95% confidence intervals of the parameters in the model are very wide, which means that we cannot really trust the estimated parameters of the model. The reason why we get so wide confidence intervals and strange values of the estimated parameters is due to that our model includes collinearity. One way to deal with the problem of collinearity is to delete one of the explanatory variables. However, we might then remove important information. Also, if we like to predict how much the cholesterol level affects the systolic blood pressure when we control for age, this means that we need to include both variables in a model. Instead of deleting one of the variables, we could combine the two explanatory variables into just one variable. However, how should we combine these two variables? One way is to combine the two variables by using principal component analysis, where we use the first principal component, P1, as our combined variable. In such a model, both estimated parameters will be positive and the confidence intervals will be a lot narrower. This is the main reason why we should use principal component regression when we have collinearity in our model. If we would perform PCA on the two variables, we would end up with the following weights that represent the first eigenvector of the covariance matrix. Watch the lectures about PCA to see how these weights are calculated. Remember that the sum of the squared weights should be equal to 1. Based on these two weights, we can now calculate PC1, which is the combined variable. If we begin the cholesterol level and the age of the first person, we see that the combined value for this person is 105. 
And if you plug in the corresponding values of person number 2, we see that the combined value for this person is 108. If you do the same calculations for the other individuals as well, we'll get the following numbers. By using these particular weights, we combine the two variables in a way that results in a maximal variance of the combined variable, where we retain as much information as possible from the two original variables. When we compute PCA for two variables, we'll get two principal components. And if we compute PCA on three variables, we'll get three principal components and so forth. Since we used PCA based on two variables, we'll get two principal components where this is the second principal component that was computed based on the following weights, which can be extracted from the second eigenvector of the covariance matrix. Note that these scores are usually presented as centered scores, where the corresponding mean has been subtracted from the scores so that each principal component has a mean of zero. If you calculate the variance of the two principal components, we see that the first principal component holds about 97% of the total variance. The whole idea of using PCA is to reduce the number of variables, also called dimensions. We therefore delete the second principal component since it contains almost no information. We are now ready to compute principal component regression, where we now simply perform linear regression by using PC1 as the explanatory variable. We should therefore estimate the intercept and the slope of the following equation. If you perform linear regression, the intercept will be estimated to negative 83.9, whereas the slope will be estimated to 1.932. If you plot the systolic blood pressure against principal component 1 with a regression line, we see that the systolic blood pressure increases when the value of the first principal component increases. Remember that the first principal component was defined like this. Let's plug in our estimated parameters in the regression model. And then we replace PC1 by the right hand side of this equation. So that we get the following equation. Let's multiply the weights by the estimated slope so that we get the following simplified equation. Let's illustrate the coefficients of the two exclamatory variables by the following two bars. These error bars represent the 95% confidence intervals for these parameters. Standard errors and confidence intervals for a principal component regression model are usually obtained by some sort of iterative method. For example, one can compute a non-parametric 95% confidence interval based on many bootstrap samples. Once we have established our principal component regression equation, we can use it for prediction. For example, let's say that we like to predict the systolic blood pressure of a person with a cholesterol level of 125 and an age of 40. We simply plug in these values in the equation and do the math. We see that the predicted systolic blood pressure for this person is 121. Now, let's have a look at an example where we have four explanatory variables. In addition to the cholesterol level and age, we now also have measurements of the body weight in kilos and body heights in centimeters of the six individuals. When we have four explanatory variables, we'll get four principal components. To know how many components we should extract, we could use the same technique as we discussed in the videos about PCA. One can also extract the number of components based on some sort of validation technique. If we have plenty of data, we could use a validation data set, but since we here only have six individuals, we will perform the Li-1 cross-validation to calculate the so-called root mean square error or prediction. 
This means that we generate a principal component regression model based on all data points except for the first individual, which is left out. We then use the PCR model to estimate the systolic blood pressure based on exclamatory variables for the person that was left out. We compute this for a PCR model including either 0, 1, 2 or 3 components. We plug in the true systolic blood pressure for person number 1. We can then calculate how far away the prediction is from the true value for the different models that extracted either 0, 1, 2 or 3 components. Next, we compute the PCR model based on person number 1, 3, 4, 5 and 6, where we now leave out the second individual. Then we predict the systolic blood pressure of person number 2 and compare it with the observed value. Once all individuals have been left out, we'll have 6 residuals. If we take the square root of the mean of the sum of the squared residuals, where n is the sample size, which is 6 in our example, we'll get the following table that shows the root mean squared error of prediction for the different number of extracted components. A model with no extracted components corresponds to a model with only an intercept. We can see that a model based on two principal components results in the lowest root mean squared error of prediction. The following plot shows how the root mean squared error of prediction changes as a function of different number of components. By using two components instead of just one, the error is clearly reduced. However, more than two components increase the error in this case. We should aim to use as few components as possible that results in a relatively small error. If we would for example extract all components, the use of principal component regression would not make sense because we will then not reduce the number of parameters that are estimated by the least square method. Since we extracted two components, our PCR model now looks like this. The two principal components have the following weights associated with the four variables. If we fit a linear model with the two principal components, we'll get the following model with three estimated parameters. If we log in the equations for PC1 and PC2, we'll get the following equation. And if we multiply these coefficients with the terms inside the brackets, we'll get the following equation where we now can add up the coefficients associated with the same variables. For example, we can add these two coefficients. Our final equation then looks like this. We can then compute 95% confidence intervals in order to interpret the coefficients and use the equation for prediction. However, one major problem with principal component regression is that the explanatory variables have been combined in a way that has nothing to do with the dependent variable. For example, the following ways have been optimized so that the first principal component has maximal variance. We see that the variable body weight has been given the highest weight because this variable contributes most in maximizing the variance of the first principal component. However, this does not necessarily mean that the variable body weight is the best variable in explaining the variance of the dependent variable. For example, if the variable cholesterol level would be the best variable in explaining the variation in the systolic blood pressure, it would make more sense to put more weight on this variable. This is exactly what the method of partial least square regression does, which we will discuss in the next lecture. Finally, note that it is common to standardize the variables so that the variables have a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. This is especially important when the variables have different units, as we discussed in the lectures about PCA. This was the end of this lecture about principal component regression. In the next lecture, we'll have a look at partial least square regression.